welcome again to the Grace Community Church this morning as we continue in our study of Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> um, we finished down through verse 17 a couple weeks ago, so uh, we're going to begin in verse 18 this morning. <clears throat> I just want to remind you of the last three verses uh, that we uh, went through, 15, 16, and 17. Uh, 15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. This whole chapter here is, uh, in the beginning in chapter 4, is the walk of the believer and how we as members of the body of Christ should walk in our daily lives. And uh, this kind of sums it up here in 15, that you walk circumspectly. Now circumspectly maybe is a little hard to understand sometimes, but it really means to walk accurate and exact but with diligence. So, uh, <clears throat> with diligence, we ought to walk accurately and exactly as the Lord would have us to walk. And of course, there's only one way as we continue on here to really do that, and able to do that, of course, is by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can, also, is the, uh, can only direct us to walk, walk circumspectly through the Word of God. That's the only way. So, it, in, it behooves us as members of the body of Christ to study and to know the scriptures and especially rightly divided as we are, uh, continue our study here. Um, uh, verse 16, it says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Boy, uh, just look around us, watch the news a little bit, and you can see that, it's sure. Uh, as it was in Paul's day, uh, he, uh, the some of the days there were very evil and uh, the things that were going on and he expected the rapture to take place at any time and uh, just remember that the rapture is at the end of the thousand uh, end of the age of grace which we are living in today which is part of the mystery as well as the rapture remember is part of the mystery the revelation that was given to the apostle paul so therefore it cannot be in the tribulation period. It cannot be in the thousand year reign. It has to be at the end of the gospel, the grace of God, the, the dispensation which we call the mystery. Because it is part of the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul, which was a secret that was never made known before. Uh, I just heard uh, this morning again on TV, there's some books coming out about the rapture and the trump and how it how they can look in the Old Testament and find it in the, uh, in the feast days and so forth in the Old Testament concerning the rapture. Well, I uh, have to disagree with them a little bit there, but uh, uh, anyway, it would probably be an interesting read, but nevertheless. <laughs> okay, in this verse 17, it says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We need to understand what the will of the Lord is, and there's only one way you can do that. And that is by the direction of the Holy Spirit from the Word, from the Word of God. That's the only way that you can fulfill the will of God. So may I hear so many people say, well, I don't know what the will of God is. You know, how do we know what the will of God is? Well, if you're studying in the Word of God and uh, uh, in prayer, asking him what he wants you to do, then there, you don't have to worry about anything else. The Spirit will direct you and give you the desires and circumstances and so forth to work out the will that God wants you to be in. So uh, it's, it's really not that hard. We, we make it really hard, and I think that's one of the tricks of the devil to get us to always wonder and try to figure out what the, the Lord really means and uh, he really doesn't mean that. Well, how are we going to do this? And how are we going to do that? And uh, therefore, we have a, many Christians that are uh, worrying about everything. And which you don't have to. You don't have to worry about anything, really. Uh, concerned, yes, but not worry. All right. Beginning in eight, verse 18 then, it says, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul says, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns. All right, let's just stick with the first part of that verse first. Be not drunk with wine. Okay, what does that tell you? about wine in scripture. Uh, is it fermented or not? Okay. <laughs> um, if 
first thing I think of is, well, why, why would it be wine if it's not fermented? It'd be grape juice, right? Well, we're going to look at scripture just a little bit here because this is this is a subject that a lot of people are they they, they don't know exactly what uh, what the scripture really says about it. And we, can we drink any wine, or can we not, or should we not? That's a good question, isn't it? As a believer, because you know the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, he says, well, he says take a little bit of wine for your stomach's sake, and there is some beneficial things to wine as far as uh, in uh, medicinal uh, remedy for things, for stomach and so forth. We'll look at that as we go on here. But I just want to <clears throat> look at a few things here. Wine, the word wine is used 35 times in the New Testament. Two of those times, it's called new wine. Now, it's in Matthew and it's in Luke, where it's called new wine. And both of those verses are concerned with putting new wine in old wineskins. It said, do not put new wine in old wineskins. Well, new wine, obviously, is not fermented. So new wine really is the, the basis or the beginning of making wine, which would be actually be grape juice. So why wouldn't you put new wine in old wineskins? Because if anybody is involved in making wine, well, this is what happens. It starts fermenting and it gives off gas and it gives off pressure. Well, if you put it in old wine skins, they're going to burst. That's what it says, I think, in Luke. It talks about that, that they will burst. But if you put it in new wine skins, which are a lot stronger, then it will not burst. And uh, so <clears throat> wine in scripture is always referred to as fermented uh, grape juice, except where it says new wine. And that's two places, in Matthew and in Luke. So just kind of remember that. Now in Luke 7, 33 and 34, 33 it says, John the Baptist abstained from its use. So John the Baptist did not drink any wine. The next thing in verse 34, right after that, it says, Jesus drank it moderately. Now, how many, if, you, if somebody would ask you, or you ask somebody else, did Jesus ever drink wine? Offhand, you'd probably say, oh, no way. No way. Because we, you know, in our culture that we live in today, you know, and uh, any kind of drinking, anything with alcohol in it is certainly a no-no. <laughs> uh, it should not be. However, if you really study it, there are some benefits in it very moderately. <laughs> and uh, so Jesus did drink it moderately in Luke 7, uh, 34. Now we get to Paul's epistles. Paul limits its use. He, he, he never says do not drink wine, but he limits its use. In 1 Timothy 3.8, in concerning deacons, he says, not given too much wine. In other words, that it was a requirement as far as deacons in the church is concerned, is not given too much wine. Obviously, if you're given too much, you're going to be drunk. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he just told us not to be, not to be drunk with wine. Uh, but uh, in Titus 2.3, it said that aged, aged women do not drink too much not given too much. Then in 1 Timothy 5, 23, he says to Timothy, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake. Okay, just going that far, as far as wine is concerned, if we as believers, if someone asks us, well, do you drink wine or not? Well, Possibly, if you have a stomach ache or in your own home, and if you, if it makes you feel better, not to the point of being drunk, of course. <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, scripturally, it's it's okay. However, in our culture today, in drinking wine uh, in public or whatever the case may be, what is it always associated with? I mean, generally speaking, you ask any Christian. Uh, what's it always associated with in our culture? Drunkenness? Or, you know, wine controlling you? And that's what these verses are talking about. Uh, maybe uh, 
bar life or whatever the case may be, it's in some way it's always associated with some type of a of, of a sin, you know, uh, causes causes man to do things that he normally would not do, because the wine is controlling his thoughts and his actions, and that is exactly what Paul means here when he says, "Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit." The opposite of being filled with wine is being filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, who controls you? Well, it's the Holy Spirit through the Word. Controls your actions, your thoughts, and so forth. And it, that's what causes us to lead a life that is pleasing to the Lord and to fulfill His will. Where in the opposite of that, if you're uh, uh, drinking wine in excess where it controls you, then you're doing things uh, because of your old sin nature, you do a lot of things which is not according to God's will and can be very harmful. So take that for what it's worth. And um, in other words, uh, think about your testimony before the Lord, before other people, with the Lord, you know. And uh, if you're out someplace, and I don't know where case may be, but you're drinking wine or something, well, it, you know, people look at that, and maybe another Christian would look at that and say, well, what are they doing, drinking wine, you know? But it's, it's just that because of our culture. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's a bad testimony because it's, for instance, if you had a new believer, a uh, new believer, and that new believer, new believer sees you, I mean, you know, you get all kinds of ideas when you're a new believer, how you should act and, you, you know, according to God's will, Certainly, God does not want us to do this and do that and so forth. And uh, so it's, uh, uh, it involves your testimony. We want to do everything that is pleasing to the Lord as far as our testimony is concerned so others can come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and also to live a life that is pleasing to Him. Okay, then Apostle Paul goes on. He says, speaking to yourselves in the Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. <clears throat> you know, every once in a while, my wife will come out in the garage and say, who are you talking to? <laughs> I don't know. Talking to myself, I guess. <laughs> but speaking to yourself. <laughs> uh, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as, you, as you're thinking about the right things as you're speaking. Speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Well, first of all, psalms, the really the literal meaning of psalms is, is music with a stringed instrument, like a guitar or anything in a stringed instrument. Uh, you think of the psalms of David, and David, you know, playing on his harp. Uh, those is his psalms. And it says hymns, and hymns is very close to being a psalms, except it not necessarily with a stringed instrument, but it's... Uh, it's more of, a, of praises to the Lord, singing praises to the Lord that's involved in hymns. And of course, spiritual songs, the psalms and hymns are spiritual songs, all types of spiritual songs. And that doesn't mean just singing any old song. It means a song that are spiritual, that has the word of God in them. That's what he's talking about. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Okay, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So when you're out, whatever you're doing, you're by yourself and you've just got to, you know, sometimes after church or whatever the case may be, sometimes I'll, I'll do something and this song, this hymn or something will go through my mind all the time and all the time. But that, what does that do? It really helps you to be in fellowship with the Lord. And you're not, it, which, which takes place of what the old sin nature in your body might be causing you to do. <laughs> so... Uh, it's, it's very important, and it's, it's good to do that. I remember, oh, let's see, years and years and years ago, when I was in the service, I was in uh, boot camp, and of course I got picked to do KP. For those of you who've been in the service, you know what KP is. Time for you to clean the pots and pans. And it just so happened to be that day we had macaroni and cheese. Now, here in the service, you know, macaroni and cheese are made in these great big pans, and it always baked under the side of the pan. You can't get it off. 
And there was two of us at this huge, big wash tub, and we were washing these pots and pans, trying to get the macaroni and cheese out. Well, I didn't want to be there in the first place, but I thought, well, you know, the only, the only way to really enjoy this is just start singing some hymns or some songs. So I did. I was standing there, you know, and I was singing hymns and songs, and this guy next to me, he says, what are you doing? What are you saying? I said, I'm just singing hymns and songs. He just shook his head and went, went on working. But, you know, it's just, there, there's times when you're doing things maybe you don't like to do. Well, just think about a, a song or a hymn or something and just start singing it to yourself or singing it out loud. It doesn't make any difference, but it really helps as far as your, your own fellowship with the Lord. Now, in doing this, it says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, giving thanks always, and that's something we always need to do is giving thanks to the Lord. He has done so much for us that there's no reason why we can't thank him in just about everything that we pray for. Uh, not only in our prayers, but just in our daily life. Just think of what he's, he's done for us and give him thanks for everything. I mean, even just look at creation. Man, give him thanks for the creation. There's, there's so many things that you can uh, thank him for. But notice it says, for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So yeah, our fellowship with God, God the Father, is always through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Our, our uh, total commitment to God, uh, our living for God, is always through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, in 1 Timothy it says, um, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one way to God the Father, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and there's so many Christians today that are that believe in God and there's all kinds of different things that they think they can do to gain salvation and completely forget about the Lord Jesus Christ. Or if they do think about him, well, he was, he was a great prophet, but I gotta pray directly to God. Well, you can't do that. The only way you can do that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So just remember, our Christian living is always through the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 21. Submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. All right? And he goes on and is talking about the wives and the husbands, but even that phrase right there, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Uh, in the fear of God is, you might say, in the reverence of God. That's what reverence really is, has the idea of fear in it. But it's uh, not that we're scared or anything. I mean, in a sense, we might think about it that way, but it's, it's reverence toward, toward God. So submitting yourselves one to another, we need to do that as a body of Christ. You know, many times, well, I don't like what that person does. I don't like what that person said. And we let all this stuff bother us, and that is a trick of Satan to get you thinking about what's wrong with other people. You know, how come they're doing this? How come they're doing that? But it's, it's submitting one to another. That doesn't mean that you submit to whatever they want to do if it's wrong, no. But as, as believers, as Christians, a lot of times, if, uh, you know, it's just the, the, uh, the mindset that we need to have towards one to another. That sometimes we need to s submit to other Christians. It just depends on what the situation is. And uh, <clears throat> so then he goes on and he says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Boy, the husbands love this here. Mm -hmm. Yes, love that, yeah. So wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. In other words... What I say, that's what you're going to do. And if you don't, you're going to suffer the consequences. I mean, that's, that's generally what the, the world says, <laughs> or they look at. But notice it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Well, how does a wife submit to her husband as unto the Lord? Well, as a member of the body of Christ, by the way, you know, Paul is writing to believers here. He never writes to an unbeliever. This would be way out of, <laughs> out of the ballpark as far as writing to an unbeliever. But uh, a husband and a wife as, a, as uh, Christians, um, both, of, both husband and wife individually uh, should submit unto the Lord uh, in their personal relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That's just natural what we should be doing as believers um, <clears throat> in the body of Christ. So it says, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now, we'll go on a little bit here. We'll, we'll go back and see the meaning here. But as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. Okay, well, we, we generally know that uh, is the head of the wife. And it's, it's not like you're the head of the wife like they, they, they have in uh, some of the Middle Eastern countries uh, where the wife or the woman is phew, way off. I mean, you do exactly what we say and that's it as far as husbands are concerned. And uh, anyway, I'm not going into detail there, but for the husband is the head of the wife. Now, why is the husband the head of the wife? I mean, even as Christ is the head of the church. Oh, now, Christ is the head of the church. He is the authority. He is the cornerstone. He is the, the head, the CEO <laughs> uh, of the church. And uh, we as members of the body of Christ need to submit to him because he is the head. Now, when it says church, that doesn't mean the building. That is talking about a body of believers. Remember, the word church comes from the Greek word ecclesia or ecclesia, however you want to pronounce it. And it, that word simply means a called out group. That's all it means. Uh, it's used in Acts chapter 19 for, uh, for the unsaved, uh, worshiping the god of Diana, uh, the goddess of Diana. And, uh, and that called out group is also called an assembly. I mean, it's called an assembly in that particular passage, which comes from the same, exactly the same word as that ecclesia. So, uh, but when we see church in the scriptures, a lot of time we think, well, it's, you know, it's a group of believers. And uh, a lot of times we think of the building, which it is really not. It's the, it's the people that are in the building, uh, Christians. They are the body of Christ. They are the church. So, and there's di different churches. That's why there's so much confusion in the New Testament today especially in the book of Acts and so forth, or in the Gospels, they see the word church, think, well, it's the body of Christ. No. Church is, like I say, is only means a called out group. In the first part of Acts, we, talk, we see uh, Peter's talking about the, or the Apostle Paul talking about the, uh, the church in the wilderness. Well, is there a church in the wilderness today? Well, what was that referring to? That's, ref that's called out that's referring to a called out group of believers in the nation of Israel back when they were going in the, in, in the wilderness for 40 years. There was a group there, a called out group. That is a church. Likewise, we have in the first part of Acts, Acts chapters uh, 1 through 7, 8, there's a church there. And that's the kingdom church. It has nothing to do with the body of Christ whatsoever. The body of Christ is never mentioned until we get to the Apostle Paul. He is the only one in scripture that mentions a body of Christ. And of course, that was the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was, it was a secret, a mystery. Okay, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. <coughs> Excuse me. Savior of the body. Uh, you just think about that a little bit. Is not Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, being the head of the church, is the, is the one that saves or is a savior of the body, the body of Christ? Talking about the body of Christ? I mean, if you look back on what the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished and what he did on the cross for each one of us as members of the body of Christ, and we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, the idea of savior has the, has the idea of preservation in it. And so he is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. And that's speaking of the body of Christ. Now, you can, you can think about that. For the husband is the, wife, is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. The husband is also the savior of the wife. Let's go on. Let the woman learn in... Oh, this is, this is 1 Timothy. I just had to throw this in here. <laughs> Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why? And he, he gives the reason here. He says, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, 
but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now this is the real basics, basic of the truth of man being the head over the woman. Is because man was created first, two reasons, man was created first, the woman second, but man <clears throat> was not deceived, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was being deceived, it was being deceived and was in transgression. So that's kind of the real basic of where Paul is coming from as far as the husband being the head of the wife. Okay, Colossians 1.18, it says that the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the head of the body, the church. Okay, here is the body of Christ, the church, the called out group of believers, which is called the body of Christ. The, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. In uh, Colossians 1.24, it says, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, I fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. The body of Christ is the church. All okay. right. Then there's, there's other uh, references you see at the bottom of the screen there. Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians 1.22, Ephesians 4.15, 5.23, which we looked at, Colossians 1.18, and Colossians 2.19. All these references are reference to Christ being the head of the church. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be their own husbands in everything. Okay, just as the church is subject to Christ, the body of Christ is subject to Christ, just as that. So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So the wives are in subjection to the husbands in everything. Now, sometimes you might say, well, man, like, what, if, what if the husband is completely wrong in what he is doing and what he wants the wife to do, which is completely against the will of God, then what? What does Paul mean here in everything? Is the ideal situation of husband and wife as a believer having fellowship with God? You know, if, if it comes between, and there's a, a, I forget exactly where, but there's a passage in, uh, I think it's Acts 16, maybe, um, <clears throat> where uh, in order to follow the law like it should be, or whatever the case may, may be, if, if somebody in authority wants you to do something that is contrary to the scriptures, then you have an obligation to go by the scriptures, to stand up for what God says. But in everything else, no, you're under authority of those that are, that are above you. So it says, so let the wise be to their own husbands in everything. Now there's a key to that uh, that's not really mentioned, it is mentioned here, but it doesn't come really, really come out. But there's a difference between a, between a man and a woman. Now, whether you know that or not, I mean, if you look, watch TV today, there, take your pick, whatever you want to be. <laughs> but there is a difference. <laughs> and uh, there's a difference not only in their physical uh, being, but also in their their mind, in their emotions, and so forth. Uh, a woman is a responder. Okay, where a man isn't so much. A man is, you know, you're driving down the road, and uh, the wife says, "Well, you're going in the wrong direction. Do you need a map or something?" I'll tell you. What. No, no, I know exactly where I'm going. Just, I can figure it out. <laughs> so, but. A woman is a responder. And if the husband, as you see here, it says, husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Now you just think about that for a minute. That's a tall order, is it not? Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Well, how did, how did Christ love the church? He gave himself for it. Notice the last phrase there. He gave himself for it. You apply that to husband and wife relationship, it is the husband's duty 
to love his wife and, if necessary, give his life for her. Now, if you have, if a husband has perfect love, the love of God, agape love, then I can see where you really have that love, you'd have no problem doing that. But just remember, a wife is not, does not have that same uh, desire. Uh, remember, she is a responder. So the more that a husband loves his wife, the more the wife is going to submit to him. That is the key to a happy marriage. Um, let's go on a couple more verses here. So that he might sanctify and cleanse it, that's the church, having it with the washing of water by the word. All right? That he... The Lord Jesus Christ might sanctify and cleanse. By the way, in the Greek, it's having cleansed. It's in the uh, aorist tense, if you ever look it up in the Greek, which means it happened at a point of time, and the action is continuing. So, it happened in the past that he might sanctify and cleanse. Sanctify comes after the cleansing. Well, what is the cleansing? What happened with the cleansing? It was when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross of Calvary for each one of us, for the body of Christ, uh, giving himself for it. And then the, the response to that, or the, the, uh, <clears throat> the next thing that takes place is sanctification. Is the sanctification, in other words, the body of Christ, as well as individuals in the body, are set apart. That's what sanctify means. It means to set apart, set apart from the world, and it's for the Lord Jesus Christ, for his own, in his body. It says, with the washing of water by the word. Now, the washing of water is a, is a figure that is used uh, by the writer here, the Apostle Paul. And it's uh, to establish the fact that the word of God is the cleansing agent that cleanses our lives. Or... If it's cleansing each one of us as members of the body of Christ, it is cleansing the body of Christ. That's what he's referring to. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church. We sang that in the song this morning, a glorious church. And really what it means there is exceedingly glorious church. It isn't just glorious, exceedingly glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. In other words, that the body of Christ might be pure and clean as possible, and it only can be accomplished by the cleansing of the Word of God to each individual and to the body of Christ as a whole. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. In other words, think of a pure white garment that you're wearing, not a spot on it, and not a wrinkle. The Word of God is very good at ironing out wrinkles and getting out spots or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That it should be holy and without blemish. That's speak He's speaking about the church right there, holy and without blemish. And that is really the way we are as our position in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are holy and without blemish, all because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. And we learned this in the first part of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 and 3. Uh, holy and without blemish. So he goes on, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Remember, uh, if you love yourself, uh, maybe sometimes people will say, well, I shouldn't have done that. I don't like myself. I don't love myself because of what I did. But uh, it really, you get down to brass tacks, <laughs> a person does love his own body. And remember, as two come together and become one in, in, in marriage, 
uh, you are one. Husband and wife are as one. So if you love yourself, you automatically love your wife and vice versa. There's a real de good description of love, which we have in, um, wow, our time's about gone here. In uh, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, it says, love suffereth long and is kind. It envieth not. It vaunteth not itself, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly. This is all talking about love now. If you have the love of God in your heart, this is the <clears throat> definition of it. Seeketh not her own, or do not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believe all things, hopeth all things, endure all things. That is the mindset that we as husbands need to have, and of course the wives also, but uh, in talking about the relationship between the husband and wife, if the husband really has this type of love, then there's no problem. <laughs> Your, the wife will be uh, responding and submitting to you, and you will be as one. The most important of all these, it says, no, at the last verse of 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, now by a faith, hope, charity, or love, these three, but the greatest of these is love or charity. For no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church, for we are members of his body. I put of his flesh and of his bones, you can put that in there if you want to, but it, uh, <clears throat> for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh then he goes on at the very end and he says this is a great mystery but I speak concerning Christ and the church so he's speaking of Christ and the church but he's relating to it as an analogy the way the husband and wife and their relationship should be the same Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Okay, just that far, we are at the end of Ephesians chapter 5. Shall we bow in a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, your truth and your word, Heavenly Father, and we can rely upon it because we know it is the absolute truth. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us your word and the truths that are in it, especially concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for uh, each one that is here this morning. Um, be with them, guide them until we meet again. And so we ask you in your precious name. Amen.